before I introduce our uh, guest speaker. Uh, evaluations have been passed out. If you're just coming in, please uh, make sure you pick up one on your way uh, to your seats. Um, we do uh, rely on your feedback to bring other such wonderful events to campus. Uh, this event will uh, go on until 12.15, so if you do have to leave early, please do so from the doors in the back so as not to disturb our speaker and uh, the rest of the audience. I do ask that you uh, turn off your cell phones. And uh, one other thing, there is uh, a book signing at the end of the presentation. So uh, if you're interested in purchasing uh, the author's book, uh, it will be available for sale and you can get a personalized, personalized copy signed by our author, so, which is a rare opportunity. You don't always get that chance to have the author sign the book. Um, so, I have the distinct honor of introducing our guest today. Bushar Rahman grew up in Corona, Queens, but her mother says she was born in an ambulance flying through the streets of Brooklyn. Her father is not so sure, but, and I'm quoting Bushar here, but I guess it would explain a few things. Bushar was a vagabond poet who traveled for years with nothing more than a Greyhound ticket and a book bag full of poems. Bushar Rahman's first novel, Corona, is a dark comedy about being South Asian in the United States. Corona was noted among 2013's best debut fiction by poets and writers and featured in the LA Review of Books among a new wave of South Asian American literature. Rahman is also the co-editor of the anthology, Colonize This, Young Women of Color on Today's Feminism, which was included in Miss Magazine's 100 Best Nonfiction Books of All Time. Please join me in welcoming Bushar Rahman to ECC. Thank you. Thank you, Farah. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. One thing that uh, students and authors have in common is that we don't like waking up in the morning. <laughs> So my solution around that was that I just didn't go to sleep last night. Um, I got on a train at 5 this morning and I'm here now and I feel like I'm in a dream. So if I pass out, um, do not be surprised. But I, I did, I, I was going to arrive last night and stay in, in your town, Fall River, uh, but the only hotel I called said it was haunted by a ghost of Lizzie Borden. I don't know. It really, do you know about this hotel? It really... So now I was like, maybe I'll just not sleep and take the train early in the morning. Um, so, but it's interesting because I, I apologize, but I didn't know who Lizzie Borden was. And the more I started reading about her, the more I realized that I had picked this name for the talk, The Voice of the Wicked Woman, before I knew who she was. Um, and uh, it's, it's oddly fitting. It was a weird coincidence. Or maybe it's her ghost getting into my mind. I don't know. Um, but the point is that my, my character, uh, Razia Mirza, the character of this novel, I think some of you have read some of the stories, she's not an um, acquitted axe murderer, but she is a, considered a wicked woman. She grew up in a very, very religious home um, in which she was taught that everything she did might send her to hell. And so her psyche was a little bit like this. This is a Pakistani woman surrounded by demons. Uh, she, you know, she was told that falling in love was a sin, showing her legs was a sin, um, 
uh, wanting to travel was a sin. Anything she really wanted to do was a sin. And this does not just apply to Muslims, this can apply to many religions and orthodox forms of religion. So she was growing up like this, but all she wanted to do was be like a beatnik and hitchhike and travel. And um, But she was told, much like they would tell the ancient explorers, that if she left her hometown, beyond this point there'd be monsters. Has anyone ever heard that saying before or seen that? Have, raise your hand if you've ever seen that phrase before. Okay, so not a lot of people. Do you know that in, ancient, in maps, in, in really, really old maps, when they didn't know what was there anymore because it hadn't been, um, no one had explored this, no European, I should say, had explored this area and mapped it out, they would just put on the map, beyond this point there be monsters. <laughs> and so it was like, there's nothing there but monsters. Don't go there. We haven't mapped it out. Of course, there were people there, um, but they called them monsters. So I wanted to share this idea of monsters and this idea of monstrosity because um, that's what Razia is considered to be. And the way that today's talk is going to work um, is that I'm going to read a little bit from the novel, and then it's going to be interactive. We're going to do a writing exercise, and I've left enough time at the end for you to read what you wrote or for us to do a Q&A or both. We'll see how it goes. But how many of you got a chance to read Pioneer Spirit? A few of you? Okay, so a few hands. So if you didn't, then I'm doing your homework for you because you can just listen to it right now. Um, this is a chapter in, in the novel Corona where Razia Mirza, the character, has run away from home and she's gotten a job working as a Puritan at a living history museum in Salem, Massachusetts. Okay, so that's how the story begins. Pioneer spirit. My f and it's okay to laugh at this story, just so you know. Um, my first summer away from Queens, I worked in Salem, a city so famous for burning women, its whole economy was based on it. I got a job at a recreated 17th century village called Pioneer Spirit. It was like a rundown Plymouth plantation, the bastard child, where all the druggies and misfits went. The ones who couldn't be trusted to stay in character in Plymouth. The ones who would forget. Pioneer spirit was different than Plymouth in that we didn't have to act like we were pilgrims. Mostly, we just hung out in costume. Once or twice a day, each of us gave tours. We had a lineup, and when it was your turn and you heard the bell, you went to the governor's house to see who had shown up, what poor tourists had been led astray had come to Salem to see the witches, and somehow got duped into taking our tour of pre-witch trial Salem, Pioneer Spirit 1630, a living history museum. Some of the folks who worked there were history buffs. They wore their costumes even when they weren't working, and actually read about Salem's history. But most of us, Walter, June, and me, were just folks who couldn't deal with having any kind of real job. Stoners who liked the idea of dressing up in costumes from the 1600s. We got by on one history book we rotated among us in our imaginations. On my first day, they gave me a white bonnet, red jacket, white undershirt, and brown wool skirt. The woman who was training us warned me it was extremely flammable, so I should try not to get too close to the fire when I was demonstrating how to make johnny cakes for the tourists. She said it in this way that made me feel she wasn't kidding, that many women had come and gone before me up in flames. Johnny cakes were made out of cornmeal and a little sugar. Puritans took them along when they went on journeys, but they couldn't pronounce journey right, so the cakes were called johnny cakes. I don't really know if this was true, but I said it on every tour. I'd stand back from the fire and hitch up my skirt in a very non-Puritan way and cook those cakes in cast iron pans, which could really have been from the 1600s. They were so old and dirty. I wasn't allowed to let the tourists taste the cakes, but my noise came out so burnt no one ever asked. At the end of my first week, I got a group made up of seven Harley bikers and one older couple. The bikers were grisly bearded and big and made me look like a tiny Puritan doll when I stood next to them. I was terrified, but, I, but if I pulled myself up to my full five feet and looked them in their faces, if I took away their motorcycles and muscles, they looked just like my bearded Muslim uncles and queens. Somehow my costume had me feeling brave, as if I really was a ghost of the past. If anyone tried to touch me, their hands would just pass through. That day was pretty hot, and my wool skirt and jacket were itching. I started off the tour by taking the bikers and the older couple to the dugouts. There were seven bikers, all different heights and widths, they looked like they had been caked with the same dirt from the open road. Standing next to them, the older couple seemed ironed out, pink, and unbelievably clean. The village was set up to go chronologically, from how the Puritans first lived when they were fobs, 
or fresh off the boat, um, to how they advanced until they were living just like the English in London, except surrounded by quote-unquote savages and wilderness instead of the ash and sin they had left behind. When everyone was gathered around, I began my tour. <clears throat> the Puritans got here during a dreadful winter. They had been lost at sea, and when they arrived, the snow was yay high. There were no houses set up with fireplaces and maids until someone had the brilliant idea to dig homes into the side of the hills. These dugouts. You can come closer and look in. The old couple pushed ahead and the Harley bikers, the Harley bikers to take a peek. Kind of dark and spooky, right? Not really welcoming. Now imagine 15 to 20 men, women, and children all cramped in here, stuck and homesick, and really sick too, with pneumonia. Whenever I said that part of the tour, I realized they sounded just like the Pakistani families I knew back in Queens, but no, I had to focus. Most of the Puritans died the first winter they arrived. Of course, the Native Americans probably would have been happy if all of them had died. The bikers chuckled, but the old couple looked shocked. They seemed to get paler, and I made a mental note to never use that joke again on a tour. Alrighty then. I moved the group a bit abruptly to the pen next to the dugouts where we kept our historically accurate goats. The couple and the bikers thankfully followed me. Well, these are our goats. There's Snowball, and that's Rosemary and Thyme. Now, these goats are not your average goats. They're historical. Not stuffed, they're real. The goats bleated in affirmation. But they are purebred, so they look, act, sound, eat, chew, and every other goat activity. They do it just like the goats did back then. The lady knelt down by the pen and started luring Rosemary with a blade of grass. These goats are pretty big, she noted. Rosemary the goat ignored her and nonchalantly turned her head and bleated. I don't think she appreciated the crack on her weight. Please, please, don't get too close to the goats. Remember, they're not petting goats. They're Puritan goats, and they can get pretty nasty. They're big because they're pregnant. And if you come back in a few weeks, there will be pregnant goat babies. I had been told by Ron, my boss, to promote Pioneer Spirit since it was on the verge of being shut down. The older man said in a dry voice, where's the father? Oh, we'll meet Winthrop the daddy in a moment. He's named after one of the first governors of Massachusetts, but he had to be fenced off in another part of the village for getting a little too frisky. And believe me, Puritan goats get frisky just like the rest. The bikers laughed, but the couple turned pink. Then, like Winthrop on the ill-fated Arabella, I turned in motion for them to follow me. We used to have Puritan chickens, too, but those had to be taken away, because, you see, Puritan chickens weren't like the scrawny weaklings we eat nowadays. They had wings long enough to fly, yes, fly, and they always ended up at the top of the governor's house. We spent so much time pulling them down, we barely had time for other Puritan things, like, I had to think about what Puritans did, like praying. We came to the bottom of the hill. Okay then, if you follow me up this hill along the stream, what stream? The older man looked annoyed at me again. Oh, the stream, shit. Will the blacksmith was supposed to turn it on in the morning. <laughs> Just one second, I ran up the hill cursing Will and brought the, found the water tap in the rocks that was supposed to create the stream. At first I thought it was stuck, but I finally got it to twist. Brown water shot out, and after a few seconds it was clear. I ran back trying not to trip on my skirt. Okay, here's the stream. They all looked up, and down the rocks, a trickle of water was slowly inching towards us. It hasn't rained, so it's drying up, but yes, if you follow me, I could tell the Harley bikers were getting a kick. The couple I could still try to win over. They had to be impressed by the next part. What is that? The wife pointed to what looked like a giant piece of shredded wheat. I walked them up the hill. Well, this strange-looking structure you see is an English wigwam. Basically, the English got tired of living like cave people in the dugouts. And you know the saying, if you live with Romans, act like Romans, or something like that. Well, the Puritans didn't really want to act like Native Americans, but they looked just so warm and healthy, and the Puritans were dying so fast, they knew they had to do something to adapt. So they copied Native American wigwams, but they couldn't give up their Englishness, so they decided to thatch the roofs instead of using leaves like the Native Americans. I brought them inside where it was cool and dark. The only problem was these English wigwams with their thatch were basically stacks of hay which could, which could burn down in a matter of seconds with nothing more than a spark. And since the inside of the wigwam was used for cooking food like Johnny Cakes, many families died, this time not from the cold but from being burned alive. Anybody got a light? It was one of the Harley bikers. I, nickel, I, I giggled and nicknamed him Chuckles in my head. But I could feel the old couple getting wound up right behind me, even though it was dark and I couldn't see their faces. I decided I was 
pretty tired of giving the tour and couldn't wait to get out of my bonnet and meet the rest of the Puritan gang for lunch. So I skipped a few stops and brought them to the governor's house. It was two stories high with real glass windows, unlike the dugouts. Compared to the other homes, it was a mansion. I guess some things never change. Okay, next is Winthrop's house, the governor, not the goat. They laughed, but their laughter sounded like bleeding more than anything else. I brought that into the front room where there was a stuffed turkey and a gun hanging over the fireplace. I waited for everyone to gather around. The old man and woman were lagging behind. They looked like they were arguing about something. He was whispering to her angrily. I tried hard not to look worried. There had been some complaints about my tours. But a few minutes later, they joined us and I was able to breathe. I continued. The Puritans were terrible hunters. They would rush through the forest, trampling everything in sight, making a ton of noise, shouting left and right, letting the animals know for miles around they were coming. So for months, the Puritans had nothing to eat but Johnny cakes. Lucky for them, they discovered wild turkey. Now wild turkeys were stupid birds and easy to catch, even for the Puritans. The Puritans were beside themselves with joy when they discovered wild turkey. I'll bet it was chuckles again, wild turkey. All the bikers started cracking up. I wasn't sure why I they were laughing, but I smiled along. The old man broke in. This is ridiculous. Turkeys were not stupid birds. Everyone stopped and turned to him. He had turned bright red. Being a person whose skin color made it impossible to blush, I was impressed. Even the bikers stepped back. This is the most historically inaccurate, ridiculous tour I have ever seen, even in Salem. Anyone who actually knows American history, he gave me a look, would know wild turkeys were not stupid birds. They were so intelligent, Benjamin Franklin wanted them to be our national bird instead of the eagle. What's wrong with eagles? One of the bikers stepped close, and I noticed he had an eagle tattooed on his arm. <laughs> there is nothing wrong with eagles, but I don't enjoy the fact that I paid for a historical tour and have gotten nothing but superficial nonsense. I winced. I knew my tour was imperfect, but superficial nonsense? I teach American history, and almost everything this young lady has said is wrong, 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 wrong. Each time he said wrong, his face deepened in color. It's because of people like her that this country is going down the toilet. There was silence for a moment, and I could feel the hair bristle on the back of my neck. I took a deep breath. I'm sorry, sir. I didn't mean to offend you. I'm sure you can get your money back. Oh, I'll get more than my money back. He turned and stormed out the door of the governor's house. His wife looked embarrassed. I'm so sorry, she said. He retired, and I think he just misses teaching. I enjoyed your tour, really. Then she ran after him. There was an uncomfortable silence. Chuckles looked at me. So, where is this frisky old goat you were talking about? They looked at me gently, and suddenly I felt so homesick for Queens, where the men who looked scary to others used to be the men who took care of me. When I got off the tour, one of the other fake Puritans, Walter, was waiting. Walter was tall and thin, had stringy red hair down to his chin. His face was freckled, and my first thought when I met him was he would look like Ichabod Crane, but if Ichabod was a stoner who did gravity bong hits and had a punk band. We had become friends after I tagged along on one of his tours to see if I could learn any new facts. His tour was so funny I almost died from not laughing. When we got to the part where there was a fake burial ground, he turned to the group and said, so, this is where the Puritans were buried. Of course, these wooden posts aren't the original wooden posts. They don't exist anymore. They rotted, just like the Puritans. That's why we don't see them either. I guess he hadn't had that history teacher on his tour. Hey, Injun, that was Walter's nickname for me. He got a big kick out of the fact that I was Pakistani and working as an English Puritan. Ron wants to see you. Did he tell you about the old guy? Don't worry about it. We get crazies here all the time. Who else would pay for one of our tours? He had a point. When I went to the old barn, which was our office, Ron was waiting at his desk. He rubbed his hand over his face. Razia, I guess you know what this is about. The old guy? You didn't call him that, did you? Of course not. Now it was my turn to be offended. I had more respect for my elders than that. Well, that was David Green. I looked blank. He's one of the board members for the Historical Society in Salem. It's because of him we stay open. I picked up some trousers which were thrown across the chair, tossed them on the floor, and sat down across the desk from him. I don't think he enjoyed my tour. No, he didn't. He thinks you should be fired. Really? He said, well, Ron hesitated. He didn't think your tour was historically accurate. But no one's tour here is historically accurate. Ron looked embarrassed. Everyone knew he had used the money for training to have ye old keg party for the staff. He'd insisted Puritans drank a lot of ale, and it would be a good bonding experience. But most of us had gotten so drunk and done such embarrassing things we couldn't even look each other in the eye the next morning. 
Well, he also said your presentation wasn't historically accurate. My presentation? The way you look. Ron looked down and then up again. But I talked to him and said you were great and we agreed you could keep your job. You could be an Indian. I could arrange for a costume and you wouldn't have to do or say anything. You know, you would just stand around and act like an Indian. But I'm not that kind of Indian. I know. And it's not like they were just standing around. They were fighting back. Ron took a long drag of a cigarette and started having a coughing fit. Razia, we're barely keeping our, do our doors open. He walked to the back door, hacking all the way. I looked out onto the ocean, and it occurred to me that this was the real reason Pioneer Spirit was being taken. Real estate. Ron spit out the oldest colonial reason. Ron spit outside before he continued. No one cares about Salem pre-witch trials. They come here to hear about the burnings, the stonings, the hangings, about death. They don't give a crap about what really happened to people when they first got here. Why don't you just put me on a stake then? That'll bring people in. Razia, Ron, this isn't fair. He looked at me. I knew he was thinking I didn't look like an English Puritan, but it was one thing to disrespect Puritans and another to disrespect Native Americans. Look, think about it. I could see Ron was upset. Come in the morning and we can talk, okay? I didn't say anything. I just walked out and down the dirt road towards the exits, and I still was wearing my costume. It didn't really matter in Salem. You could walk down the street in full 17th century garb and no one noticed. Half the population did. Everyone was stuck in the past, wearing costumes, pretending they were someone they weren't. I thought of the Harley bikers and I thought of my Muslim uncles. And then I thought of my father the day he told me I had to leave his home. All too often, his face, ash gray, would rise up in my mind, and each time it would shock me, the way the full moon shocked me when it rose against the buildings in Queens. I walked faster. Outside the gate, the Harley biker clan was hanging out in the parking lot. They were smoking and passing around a brown bag. Hey there, sweetie, out early? It was Chuckles and his gang. They looked happy to see me. No, I think I just got fired. There was a general growl, fuckers, Chuckles said, and on cue, all the rest of them spit or mumbled curses. Chuckles passed me the brown paper bag. Wild turkey? I looked inside and then laughed. I raised the bag to my mouth and let the whiskey burn through my body. I could taste Chuckles' mouth on the neck. Thank you. That is the one story, Pioneer Spirit, um, from the book. And um, so the way that I wrote that story was I told it many, many, many times before I ever wrote it down. Um, because it's a work of autobiographical fiction, something like that did happen to me. And so I would tell my friends this crazy story over and over and over again until I was able to commit it to paper. And so saying that, the writing exercise we're going to do, I hope you all are ready for writing exercise, um, is inspired by that writing process. And it's something that you can do whenever you're feeling stuck, whenever you don't know how to start um, an essay or, or a story, you can tell the story out loud to a friend, to your phone, to your computer, whatever you want, record it if you're not telling someone, and then you can, and then that helps you get over the writing block of knowing what to say. So we're gonna practice that, okay? Um, so what we need for this exercise is you need a paper and a pen, something to write on and with, and you'll need a partner. So if you would like to just pick a partner, um, just everyone pick a partner, you know, the easiest is whoever is near you. I know that they're not, it's an, maybe an odd number of people and maybe not everyone's near someone, so I'll Raise your hand if you need to pair up with someone. Okay, this is going to be um, a timed exercise. So I want you to, you'll have to listen for my cues on when to do certain things. So, does everyone have a partner? Yes? Yeah? Okay. So, you have three minutes, which believe it or not is a long time for telling a story. Um, you have three minutes each to tell each other a story about a time that you got into trouble. <laughs> it could be this morning, it could be when you were a child. If you don't want to share your own time of getting in trouble, maybe you could tell a story of someone else you know who got into trouble. But you're going to have three minutes. So the first person tells a story for three minutes. The partner just listens. So you're actively listening, that's all. You're not taking notes, you're just listening, laughing, whatever, gasping, whatever you need to do. Um, and then I will say switch, and usually that's enough time, so I'll say switch, and then the second person tells a story 
and the other person listens, okay? So that's all you have to think about for now. I know it's early, so, well, it's early for me. <laughs> I usually don't get up until 10.30 a.m. So, um, it's, uh, so let's, let's, I'll tell you when to start, okay? Any questions about what you're doing? For now, you're just telling a story of when you got into trouble. That's all. Okay? Ready? Begin. <laughs> so wrap up your story and switch. So now the second person tells their story. Okay. So wrap up your second story. Does anyone need more time? Okay. So now um, the next point, the next item is going to be that now you are going to write. You're going to write your story down in the same voice you told it. So um, this, if it was you know, really informal, casual, if you were cursing, if you were doing tangents, if you were started off with jokes, whatever you want, you're going to write down the same way. Start um, the same way you started, end in the same way you ended, in order to capture your storytelling voice on the page. And I will give you um, seven minutes to do that. Okay? That should be more than enough. And if you need more time, I'll give you more time. Okay? But we'll start with seven minutes. Three. We'll take one more minute. And for those of you who are finished, we have time for some volunteers to read. So you can share your stories of personal misadventure and entertain the crowd. Uh, you, and I, I can bring this wherever you are. So <laughs> think about if you want to read some of your story, all of your story. You have to read it, though. You can't tell it. You have to read it, whatever you wrote. I know a lot of people. <laughs> oh Thirty seconds. So. You want to call? Well, I would love to have a student do it, but if if they're not volunteers, I would. Oh, there's going to be plenty of time for both. Okay. <laughs> so. All right. All right. Yeah. Okay, great. Okay, so let's come together. I'm going to bring the microphone to you if you're interested. Introduce yourself to the group. And um, there, we have half an hour, which is enough time for people to read. And I want to leave time for a Q&A. So if you have any questions about writing, um, I know your teachers may have given you some questions. All right, so I'm going to bring the microphone to you. <laughs> let's see. You really will get to know each other in a whole other way right now. <laughs> okay, go ahead. When I was five, I had just turned five. I got sick on Easter Sunday. I had no, one, no appetite, unusual in itself, and the doctor was called. I was transported to the hospital with scarlet fever. I was put in a crib, hey, I'm five, and was quarantined in my room. I could see and speak just to the kid across the hall, in her crib, who also had scarlet fever. We got into a conversation about age. Five didn't seem so special anymore. She was six, I was seven, she was almost eight. We were really mad. <laughs> Lunch was beef stew. Hospitals in 1958 weren't colorful, they were white. Floors, <laughs> ceilings, walls, everything. Finally, our anger about who was older spilled over. We grabbed handfuls of beef stew and heaved them across the very white hallway at one another. <laughs> when nurses came on the scene, they looked mad. They scolded as much as they could scold small quarantined patients. Then they closed our doors. Wow. <laughs> My God, I love the color that you added in that, or lack of color. It just made it real. It's really awesome. And that was Beth. Um, who would like to share their story next? I saw some people passing their stories back and forth up here. Would anyone from the group over here like to read? No? Um, or, or you're also welcome to... Well, let's start with the readers first. And then if we don't have enough readers, I will allow a few tellers. Because telling a story is also really fun. Mm -hmm. So, any, any readers? And teachers, can students get some credit for reading? <laughs> Would that, that help? I don't know, teachers. Yes? Okay, I'm hearing a yes up there. I feel like I'm on the prices right. 
I'm hearing a yes up there. Okay, so you can get some credit. I don't know what kind of extra credit for reading something you already wrote. Okay, so. All right, so tell us your name and. Go ahead. He noticed that there was only one pair of shoes under the bunk bed. So he came in the room and noticed that my shoes were still on my feet when I was sleeping. He woke me up and made me go downstairs to explain to my mother why I had my shoes on. I told him my sister wouldn't allow me to put my shoes under her bed. I did not know what to do with them, so I went to sleep with them on. My mother gave me a wallop on my butt and kept my shoes. I was then sent back to bed. Okay. <laughs> and there's all these great images, like little kids throwing beef stew across an antiseptic hallway, kids sleeping in their shoes. Um, who else would like to get some extra credit? <coughs> wow, it's so easy. Okay, no one? Does anyone want to tell the story? Tell their stories. All right, I feel like we're being left out of some great secrets because I heard a lot of laughter going on <laughs> when people were actually telling their stories. All right, last call, no? Okay, all right, we have two people here and then maybe there'll be some more brave volunteers and then we can open up a Q&A. Um, okay, here, okay. All right, yes, just, just introduce yourself. All right, mm -hmm. uh, Melly, right? Mm -hmm. uh, my name is Susanna, and um, I'm going to tell a story about my first year in college uh, in Brazil many years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, in my first year of college, I had a very interesting linguistic teacher. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a presentation to do, like any classroom. And for some reason, I came up with this 10 years old newspaper cutout to incorporate into my uh, presentation work. Well, I went to class, I thought, hey, this is relevant, sounds like it uh, fits the subject, so I'll do it. Uh, after our presentations, uh, not just mine, but the other students as well. The teacher gave me a evil eye and said, all right, you there, you wait for me after class. I knew something was not right, even if it seems silly. What does the newspaper article has to do with it? And that was the problem. The teacher asked me, how did you come up with this newspaper article? Where did you find it? And I was puzzled by the question. I said, well, in my newspaper cutout uh, collection, do you have a collection of newspapers? And I said, well, sure, don't you? you? <laughs> and she said, no, I don't. But how did you find a 10 years old cutout newspaper? And I said, well, I don't have a library system at home, but I do have a memory. And I did remember this article, and I just spent a week trying to find it in piles of papers, but I did find it. Anyway, the teacher, although gave me the credit for the presentation, she did not think was a good thing a student. Uh, uh, to come up with such an interesting old newspaper article that fit well in, in the presentation. Hmm. So she said, all right then, well, I tell you that I'll give you the credit, but don't come back to my classroom. <laughs> and I said, what? Well, I don't want you here anymore. You don't need to come to hmm. my classroom. And I said, okay, fine with me. I can use the time to catch up with other subjects. I think what struck me was the fact that she was upset with the cleverness of finding an old piece of paper hmm. that applied well to the subject. Hmm. That is very, 
Very odd teaching, <laughs> yes. <laughs> what was the subject? Linguistics. The subject was linguistics. Linguistics. Okay. And, well, th did, and why didn't you want to read what you wrote? Because you didn't finish, or? Uh, I did not finish, mm -hmm. but I think it, it needed a little bit more details. And, okay. you know, for second language, I always mm -hmm. have trouble with my tense, verb tense, and so forth. Okay. But, but the way that you told it was... Great. It was perfect. It had a beginning, middle, end. And a lot of times in our writing, we don't know how to find that arc, or we don't know how to begin a story or begin an essay. And I thought that you began that in a great way, and you ended it in a very great way. So just this is a good exercise for you. If you ever need to write on a topic, um, say it out loud. Tape, if you tape recorded yourself, your tenses were perfect in, when you said it. So. If you tape record yourself, um, you can then write it um, the way that you told it. And then you can learn about tenses that way. OK, so maybe one last reader. Um, anyone? Anyone else? No? OK. Sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. OK, hi, I'm Denise DiMarzio, English faculty member here. Mm -hmm. And I think maybe some of my students might like to hear the story. <laughs> and from what I overhear in my classroom, I think we're really missing out on hearing some of their stories. Too shy, I guess. Okay. Um, did I ever tell you this story before? Well, when I was in the first grade, I used to run away from school. I had a mean teacher, Miss Caporelli. I was used to my grandmother, a kind, gentle lady, and I had had a kind kindergarten teacher, too. But then we moved, and this teacher was new. Anything could make me afraid. Something different that was going to happen that day, a substitute teacher, any of them could set me off. So my mother would drop me off uh, at school and then go out on her errands. Um, we'd come down a little side street and then turn onto the main street of the school. As soon as she dropped me off and drove away, I would turn back and walk back the way we had just come. <laughs> <laughs> I had to cross a fairly large street, um, so I had my escape route, which I followed back to my grandparents' house, uh, who Aww. lived near the school. I always thought that my grandmother didn't tell on me, but somehow my mother always found me. <laughs> <laughs> my grandparents had a four-poster bed. I remember one time I was hanging onto the poster for dear life, my arms and legs wrapped around it, and my mother really angry and pulling me off the bed, <laughs> which I clutched desperately. I don't remember what kind of trouble I got into then. My mother always yelled at me, but I can't recall any consequences. She did go to the school to talk to the teacher, but not much changed. I must have run away at least a half a dozen times in the first grade. Wow. Well, <laughs> often, often teachers are the worst students. Um, that's why we became teachers. But great. All right. So if, unless there's any last calls, we'll open it up for um, a Q&A of any questions that you have about what you read in class, any questions you have about writing, publishing, English, Puritan villages. <laughs> I have a question. I, I realize that I, I jumped in there, but are, are all, many of you familiar with Salem, Massachusetts? You are? OK. I, I thought that maybe, um, is, if anyone is not familiar, it's a place in Massachusetts um, where 19 women were killed for witchcraft. And there was a bit of a witch craze. And the entire town has built its entire economy around this is a tourist attraction. So everywhere you go, there are people dressed up as witches and dressed up as Puritans and um, pirates, anything related. It's just such a weird place. It's like Halloween all the time in Salem. How many people here have been to Salem? OK, so a number of you have. Did you go to Pioneer Spirit? <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> OK. No one really goes there, which is why it is now shut down. Um, so any questions that you have? I know some of you may even have homework based on this talk. So if there were any questions in your homework, and this is not cheating, I just thought if you had mm. questions you wanted to discuss that are homework questions, we could do that too. Yes? So how loosely is a novel based on your life? Do you say somewhat so, relatable? Or? So how loosely? Um, so I did mention that this is a uh, genre I like to call autobiographical fiction. Um, people call it creative nonfiction too. I don't know what the percentage is, <laughs> um, but I've tried to figure it out. Um, the character is a Pakistani girl who grew up in Queens in a really uh, rundown neighborhood. She runs away from home um, and has 
different adventures and all of that did happen to me. I think that the parts that are fiction are the parts that I could not remember and so I fictionalized those parts and sometimes I, I, I made up things like for example I would make up things which I felt were true like they really were true but it didn't happen exactly that way like for example the ending of this story that exact thing didn't happen there was that tour there was that exchange um, but the boss did not ask me to dress up as a Native American um, but to make him do that made it, it captured a truth about that place in that there was this feeling there that um, a person who was Pakistani should not be playing a Puritan like that people did mention that a number of times so I, I basically just um, dramatized that feeling into a moment so and I, I like fictionalizing life because then you know you can make things happen that didn't happen you can have endings that didn't happen um, but I don't think all my books will be autobiographical but this one was thanks any other questions? How many people here are interested in being writers? Is there, are, do we have any writers? Great, okay, so if we have any writers in the room, if you have questions about writing, publishing, yes? Do you find it easier to find inspiration to write mm -hmm. with the culture that you live in, like Brooklyn? I know my aunt's from Brooklyn, and that's all she raves about is Brooklyn. <laughs> <laughs> I think that you know what it is, is that there's a, a strong artistic community there. Yeah, it's very diverse. Yeah, it's very diverse. I think that there is um, inspiration everywhere, um, but you have a lot of, there's a lot of support in Brooklyn for the arts. So um, I can find readings every night. Like there's open mics um, every night. There's multiple open mics. Like it's not just one place where you can go and read your work, but there's like hundreds of places. and. There's different artistic groups that meet. Um, that when you do a reading, you know, there's people, lots of people who come out. Um, there's writing groups. There's music happening. So I think that 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 is really amazing. I mean, the city can distract you from your work, so you can end up like always feeling inspired, but you're always partying too hard to do the work. So that's a problem with the city. But um, I think that if you can discipline yourself and write the stories down as well as go out all the time to literary events you got yourself a solid career um, but I do love Brooklyn it's so expensive I, that I, you have to be crazy to live there these days but we do it because of that we do it because of the artistic environment that we have where does your aunt live in Brooklyn? Is it uh, near the ocean, or is it? Uh... I really, really couldn't tell you. Never been there. <laughs> okay. Never been there. Oh well, it's not that far. I just took a train this morning. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I just I took a train. <laughs> yeah, it's really not that far, as I discovered this morning. I it only took about, well, the train was late, but three hours, three hours on a train. It's not bad. Uh, I saw another. I saw some other hands. I think up there about writing. Questions about writing. What are the opportunities to read your work here or share your work here? Are, is there an open mic? Is there a literary series? Is there a literary magazine? There is a literary magazine? We have an online literary magazine called okay. Prevailing Wind. Prevailing Wind. It's an open call for submissions oh. right now. Right that. So you're going, if you can finish this story that you wrote, you can <laughs> submit it to Prevailing Winds anonymously if you don't want anyone to know that it was you getting into trouble. Um, yes. I have a mm -hmm. question about your other story, The Old Italian. Is that okay to ask? Yes. Mm -hmm. I, my students had to read both. So. Okay. Mm -hmm. So um, I found it really, really striking in that story, mm -hmm. the concept of um, the, 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 the group of boys. Oh, let me, let me give you this. Okay. <coughs> yeah. Okay, thank you. So the question is about the Old Italian PR, PR in the story mm -hmm. that uh, we had um, available to us. So it strikes me about that story kind of staying with me is about um, how, uh, in the end, you know, the, the mean boy has the kitten in there, they're mm -hmm. doing some terrible <coughs> kitten, mm -hmm. and the old Italian man who he was uh, 
reaching out to this group of children. He wasn't judging them, it seems. Mm -hmm. He was trying to interact with them. When he sees this happen, this, the boy harming the, the kitten, mm -hmm. uh, he then makes a judgment on the whole group based right. on the actions of one. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering if you could talk about this idea in your work of a particular group being judged negatively mm -hmm. on the actions of just one of them. Right. Okay. Thank you. Great. That's a great. That's a great question. I know that that there. I hear some rustling happening. So we'll. I'll answer this question, and then what we can do is, um, if it's okay with the teachers, we can use the last five minutes for book signing or individual questions, or um, but or if there's other questions. So the question is about. Um, and how many of you read the old Italian? Also, so you're familiar with that story then. Um, so. I, this book was definitely written um, with that idea in mind that often an entire group of people will get judged for the actions of a few. And being a Muslim American, I definitely think that that's something that is something that we live with a lot um, because of the 9-11 attacks. Our lives in this country totally changed. Um, I'm old enough that I remember what it was like before and what it was like after. And, it, it, and especially being a New Yorker, I, you know, I was born in Brooklyn, I grew up there, and I witnessed the city change almost overnight from a place that was open to diversity and where people were really um, you know, cool. Even though people lived in their bubbles, the bubbles lived peacefully together. And then that just suddenly exploded where um, you know, Muslims were getting attacked. Uh, many of my friends were attacked and beaten up. Um, you know, it just changed the entire landscape of our, the city I loved so much and called home and, um, you know, and, and also the landscape of this country. So I definitely think that that old Italian story is a, is a you know, one uh, childhood version of what happened later on. And I think that the, the young girl, Razia, the shame that she feels in there, um, some people have asked me about that. And I think that what happens is that even if something is uh, not fair, people will internalize those feelings themselves of shame or of, you know, maybe I'm bad or... Um, and then, but as you see that later on, what happens to her in the book is that she becomes quite confident and shameless. And so I feel that that's also a possibility that sometimes if you've experienced shame so much, you might just say, you know, forget it, I'm not going to let other people judge me, I'm just going to be my own person. So uh, in the book, I wanted that arc to happen, is that even though she starts out this way as a child, later on in the book, you see her being quite confident and even shameless. She's described as shameless, but she's shameless because she's experienced shame and she realizes it's just bogus, you know, it's not, it's not anything that she really wants to experience. So that's yeah. Thank you for that question. Okay. Any any last questions? No. Okay. So if teachers, um, oh, there is a question. Yes. The I'm going to bring this. I'm going to bring this up to you so I can hear you. Okay. Okay. Ooh, getting my exercise here. <laughs> okay. Yeah, um, mm -hmm. back to the question uh, <coughs> to the reading book. Why are they concerned about the, bo uh, the boy's woman? The boy's woman. Why do they, why con do they call her? Yeah. Um, why do they call her a wicked woman? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So um, in, this, in this story, what happens is that, you know, Razia is growing up in a very religious community and um, in order for her to uh, date who she wants to date, um, it, what happens is that she dates outside of the community. And she dates someone who's not Muslim, and her family disapproves of this. And so anyone in her community who dates outside of the community is considered um, you know, committing a sin. And so that's something that happens in one of the other chapters that I think you got two chapters, but there's um, 11 chapters in the book. And so you see that that's, that's why she was um, kicked out of her community. So, um, but she's, I don't believe that she's wicked and I, I don't believe that, I don't believe she's wicked, um, but it's just what she is considered. 
Okay, well, that's a great question. Okay, so we can use the rest of the time I can answer one-on-one -on -one questions. I'm sure teachers want to get their students together and maybe give them assignments if they want to. But we'll be out here, I'll be out here for the next five, ten minutes. If you have any individual questions. Please don't forget mm -hmm. to fill out the evaluation forms. Yeah. And if you would like to purchase a copy of the book and get it signed, mm -hmm. uh, meet us outside, uh, meet Bushra outside. Okay. okay, cool. All right, thank you very much. Mm -hmm.